Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard McCabe. I'm a photography curator at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, New Orleans, and I'm happy to be here today to talk to El Kasimu Harris about his new series, Vanishing Black Bars and Lounges. Uh, Kasimu is one of the 45 photographers who are in the new Revelations recent photography acquisitions exhibition at the Ogden. And uh, I just want to uh, congratulate Kasimu. He just uh, photographed the cover story for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, the title of the story is A Terrible Price, The Deadly Racial Disparities of the COVID-19 in America. And uh, Kasimu has been a great friend of the Ogden Museum. He is on the Ogden Board of Directors. And he was also in the rising uh, photography exhibition in 2015, which was our 10 year anniversary of the Hurricane Katrina. Uh, disaster and of course he's now in Revelations and he also wrote a great essay for the new Southern Photography catalog called Dismantling of Southern Photography. So thank you Kasimu for joining us today on this online Ogden programming. Thank you, thank you. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking about the Vanishing Black Bars and Lounge series. Um, this is a little bit different work for you because um, from the Benighted series, which was about uh, the education system and racial disparities in the education system, and then the Black Continuum series, which was about uh, police brutality, and there was a lot of, those works were kind of constructed uh, narrative. Uh, you kind of had collaborators in your subjects, and here it's pretty much a straight documentary uh, kind of lends itself to your photojournalistic work. So just let you take the stage now and talk about this uh, series. Yeah, this is, even though this is later work, this is more uh, directly related to my introduction to photography, which came from photojournalism. Uh, I started off as a writer in maybe 2002, 2003, and uh, I I moved into photography. I added photography to the skill set in 2005. And, you know, that was photojournalism working at the student newspaper in Mississippi. So this, even though, uh, so those constructed realities, I think that's the title you gave it. And I love it. I keep using it. Uh, that was something that came uh, further along into my career. Uh, so this is, again, it's just a return to just the, the basics um of storytelling not staging anything not altering a photo uh, really a return to my roots in reporting where you're looking for the story you're looking for the narrative and you're talking to people you're finding facts and uh so that's what that's what all of this is so you were born in new orleans correct i mean you're a native Nor new orleanian and um i mean this work you can tell it's very it means a lot to you. You're telling the story of your hometown. And um, just how, um, just maybe tell us how you got started on this series. What was it that brought you to make this, make this work? I think a lot of stuff comes from uh, either like a curiosity or sometimes just a deep frustration about something. And you know, Ellis Marcellus told me one time when I was a teenager, I was just giving this long rant to him. And he said, uh, paraphrasing, you know, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Or, you know, uh, well, won't you show them how it's done? So uh, just a way of controlling the, the narrative within a Black community or uh, because I don't feel that people outside of our community cannot tell these stories. I just... Conversely, I feel that not enough people within a black community tell these stories, uh, but it came from the original idea. I was really enamored with Bernie Imes' book, uh, Juke Joints, which he did in the Mississippi Delta. You know, I went to school at Ole Miss. Uh, so it was, I read it, I loved it. You know, I didn't really know who he was. I didn't know if he was black or white at first. It, it, it really didn't matter. Uh, again, I said back to the original statement I just made, but, uh, it was an idea that I said, oh, I could do this in New Orleans, but it was something I said I would try to do five, six, seven, eight years down the road. It wasn't anything I had any immediate intention to do, but 
uh, bars in New Orleans started gentrifying uh, very rapidly. So I figured I had to do it more immediately than later. And, you know, I mean, that's a tradition, a great tradition in photography. You know, you have people like Ajay in Paris in the early 20th century, documenting in the changing city. Uh, people like Walker Evans photographing, you know, the vernacular architecture of the South. And, uh, you know, William Christenberry, too, a document in the vanishing, you know, vernacular architecture of Hell County. And, but tell, just tell us what these places mean to the black community. I mean, I mean, the only thing I could maybe think of uh, equally is maybe the pub in Eng England, you know, the English pub. So, I mean, what is the black lounge in the bars? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the community? That's a great connection. I think about that connection all the time. Uh, so here we're looking at, and this is my fault, the way I labeled it. Uh, this is uh, Big Man's uh, Lounge on Louisiana. Okay. And that's, that's just the way. What happened was uh, the young men of Olympia, they had a second line that day. And uh, second lines in New Orleans come out of the Benevolent Society tradition. Uh, black bars also come out of the tradition of black spaces that uh, here in New Orleans, we have them on record from the late 1800s, the late 1800s. Um, one was like uh, the Pythian Temple, uh, upstairs in the Pythian Temple. Um, um, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on some, some other ones. Um, but from these black spaces that they had, and these, they may have been like uh, fraternal lodges, mason halls, or just social aid and pleasure clubs. Uh, they would often own property. Uh, and eventually, Economy Hall is one that's really attributed to uh, also starting second line funerals, uh, the, the jazz funeral. So you would have people who join these organizations uh, and ensure its members of a proper burial, basically like a co op, making okay. sure everyone was taken care of, right? right? So from that tradition, that's where the black bars come from. So they date back really, there's a long tradition okay. here in New Orleans. So how that relates back to the second lines is that uh, here in the community, a lot of the uh, second line groups uh, stop at their favorite bars and along the neighborhood. So this one was taken the day the young men of, of Olympia paraded. And I believe that group is about 130 years old or, or older. So they start off at Sportsman's Corner, they went to Big Man Lounge and they probably had a, about four more stops because you gotta think they're parading through the city uh, through a neighborhood, three or four miles, dancing the whole time. So they have these little respites at bars where they could take a take a break, use the restroom, get something to drink, all kind of things. And uh, they these bars are the epicenter of Black culture, whether it be the Black masking Indians or just the family, uh, the extended family that comes out of there. Uh, it's more than just a place to get a drink. It's really uh, it's the adult community center. Well, um, I mean, so what is, is it just the economics that's happening in the, you know, the neighborhoods are changing, the being gentrified and white kids are finding them a hip bar and, you know, just, it changes the whole dynamic. I mean, I know you were kind of concentrated on, uh, was it St. Bernard Avenue? There's like right. six bars there that were really changing over. Right. Yeah, I think it's a lot of things. I spoke to my cousin, Al Jackson. He's the uh, founder of the Treme Petit Jazz Museum. And he gave me a lot of history. Uh, one of the things that he said was, of course it was justification, but it also has to do with changes in, in labor. So uh, the longshoremen, once that went to robotics, that eliminated a lot of people. Uh, he said to a, less, a lesser degree, the postal service, the, the shrinking of the Postal Service. And he said more recently, uh, when you had all the, after Katrina, all the black teachers that were fired. So he said each kind of thing eliminated a black middle class, right? And wow. shrunk the neighborhood, you have displacement. And then he said also it was my generation, the younger people who uh, their tastes have changed. Mm -hmm. They that we have a certain freedom or perceived freedom to go wherever we want to go. Uh, instead of, you know, going to the uh, black owned places, we go anywhere where our money, uh, we, we think it's welcome. So he said they went to places where they, 
they knew they were welcome. His generation, he's about 75. So wow. that's some of the things that led to it. And uh, then lastly, a lot of the owners, uh, they don't have, um, they don't have uh, contingency plans. Uh, contingency plans is not the word I'm looking for, but where uh, like a legacy plan or a succession plan where you want to sell to your kids. A lot of people don't want to sell to their kids. Or a lot of kids don't want to buy it. Or a lot of people just get tired and they, they get a, there's an opportunity for a huge payday. And mm -hmm. they think, so it's, it's a number of factors that, that lead to the, the bars being black turning white. Right. Well, I was, you know, I was thinking about Bernie Imes, you know, and the juke joint and the, you know, the Delta, you know, those were the banishing juke joints, but that was, you know, blues music that, you know, taste of music changed. So I guess when blues was no longer popular with the young black kids, you know, the, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think the music taste changed in those places. So they just kind of dwindled away. So um, that too, right. but um uh, so how does the written word going from a person who writes, um, is a writer of words to a maker of images, how does, I guess, how does that inform your photography, the written word, or is there parallels, or do you find it very different, the transition really is one? Um, it's something I'm thinking about all the time. Um, and sometimes is the parallels or the connections may be more apparent than others. Sometimes it comes through in process. Uh, with the, the Constructive Reality series that I do, it's uh, always a lot of research and mm -hmm. I often write outlines uh, or if you want to call them storyboards. Now for the images that are uh, telling it like it is or more photojournalism or documentary related, uh, you know, I'm thinking about things that you would read in a struck and white book, elements of style, like omit needless words, trying to be really clear, trying to move the narrative. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about those things. It's like if someone were only to see one image, uh, mm -hmm. what story does that one image convey? Uh, because sometimes that's all you have an opportunity to do. Uh, for instance, in your current show, you know, I, you had to think about what two images would best tell the story, you know? So it's like if a novelist had an excerpt of, from their book, you know, what chapter best represented that? So we had to think about those two images that would, you know, convey that story. Uh, so I'm thinking about writing most often with my work and, um, you know, things like reporting for details, uh, trying to uh, appeal to the reader's senses. So that's all writing techniques that has uh, informed my photography. Well, um, you've been doing this project now for two years. Are you, is it continuing or, or do you feel like you've wrapped it up? Or I, I saw the, um, so how are you feeling about it? And, you know, I hate to say that the COVID-19 thing, I mean, that's going to be a horrible, you know, effect on, on these bars too, you know, them being closed for two months now. So I just wondering how, how far along you are with this project and are you um, feel like you're going to continue it for, for years to come or do you think you're wrapping it up pretty soon? I think I could stop now, but I'm not. Uh, I want to go much deeper into the stories. The New York Times article that came out in February allowed me to do that. Uh, so I also look at this as like an ethnography and it's a lot more old histories that I like to get from this in addition to the images. And, uh, you know, just last week I was passing along St. Bernard Avenue and there's this bar called the Association. It's a black owned bar and it's a much younger crowd, uh, but you go in and you could tell that it's still a black bar from the 1950s or 60s. And uh, they were doing things like uh, selling food outside, selling drinks outside. Uh, so trying to continue to feed themselves, to pay all these bills. And uh, Kermit Ruffins that same day was giving out red beans from his mother-in-law lounge. So some of them are going to close. Hopefully they don't. Uh, but it's a story that, you know, 
I want to continue because this project for me is about people, the place, and the ephemera. Uh, so, you know, I always tell people when I sit down for an interview, uh, this is, imagine this being a portrait and the best figurative portraits are the ones with the most detail. So that helps with people being uh, easy to tell very anecdotal stories or any little details. And that's really important for me. And, and more also, I've also started doing uh, cities outside of New Orleans. So mm -hmm. in February, thanks to a curator, Kalolo Lucky at the August Wilson Center, I went to uh, Pittsburgh and I had a chance to work at some of the bars in Pittsburgh. And they're, they're much different than the black bars here in New Orleans, but uh, I wanna do uh, bars outside of New Orleans as well. And sometimes also in some small cities because uh, you know, it's not just the urban areas that had bars. Mm -hmm. Well, I love the installation you did at the August Wilson African American Center where you had the, you kind of replicated a bar and you had a seating around it. So it had the feel of a New Orleans um, bar. And then you had books around that kind of influenced you. And I thought that was really cool. Um, so congratulations on that show. And Congratulations on the series, Kasima. It's really amazing, and it's it's so great to see you just your trajectory, just in your star rise. I mean, you work so hard, and your work is fantastic, and everything you do is very different, and it's it's just so successful. And you deserve all the great things that have been coming to you. And um, I really just appreciate your uh, friendship with the Ogden, and you know, it's just so great to see your success and uh, you know, it's just gonna get bigger and bigger. So um, thank you so much. And we're looking forward to seeing where this project goes, you know, and uh, thanks for the time today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you again for uh, putting me in that show in 2015, The Rising. It was the first, uh, I guess, big institutional show that I was in. And, and uh, that's you, I look at that as definitely important uh, point in my career. So thanks for working with me then and thanks for working with me now. And uh, I love being uh, part of the Ogden family. Appreciate it, Kasim. And uh, you take care and thanks for spending some time with us today. Thank you.